Good evening. Welcome to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College. My name is Carol Allman Morton. I have a few sh short announcements and I'm, we're going to offer a land acknowledgement and then we'll get rolling. With gratitude and humility, we acknowledge that those of us in the Berkshires are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people, who are the indigenous peoples of this land. Despite tremendous hardship in being forced from here, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. To learn more about programming at Ollie at Berkshire Community College, you can check out our website, berkshireollie.org. We have a number of programs coming up in the next month, so be sure to look at our calendar of events at berkshireollie.org forward slash events. Included are uh, distinguished speaker lectures on art and Auschwitz and climate change and human migration, not to mention the remaining lectures in this series. Registration for our spring semester is now open and classes begin the first week of April, so register today. We'd also like to thank the Berkshire Supergenarians whose gift made it possible for us to get the word out to more people about this lecture series. As we go along, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Our speaker is going to speak first and then we'll do all the questions in a chunk together. Alrighty. Oh, and there were some questions in the chat. Hold on, some logistical stuff. This will be recorded. Um, and it'll be posted on our YouTube page. It'll be free and open to the public, so you'll be able to share it out. We'll email everybody who's registered uh, with the link once the recording is posted. And everybody is muted because this is in webinar mode because there are hundreds of you. And so uh, you'll only see the speakers today. Alrighty, so I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Jane and Corbia Matina to introduce our speaker today. Thank you all and have a great time. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. Um, just a couple of thank yous to start off. First, I want to tip my hat to the people in the OLLI office, Carol, Ray, and Judith, for the wonderful job uh, that they did in putting this series together. It would not have been possible without them. Um, they're really superb. I want to thank all of you for uh, deciding to share some of your, your evening with us. And of course, I want to thank Mark Pettis. Um, for being the first uh, speaker in this series of four lectures. Um, as Carol said, if you would put your questions into the chat um, after Mark's one hour lecture, um, I will um, um, convey some of those questions to Mark in the order in which they were um, submitted. So just a very, very quick um, introduction to 21st century medicine. If you do want to know more about it, there would be two books that I would recommend. One of them is The Age of Scientific Wellness, and that's by Leroy Hood. And the second one is Outlive by Peter Atia. That has been on the bestseller list um, for quite a number of months. Um, there are four foundations to 21st century medicine. One of them is a preventative aspect, and Mark Pettis, Dr. Mark Pettis, will talk today on lifestyle issues that can improve your longevity and well-being. The second foundation is that it is 21st century medicine is predictive. Um, next week, we will have Hod Lipson, Dr. Hod Lipson from Columbia, and he will talk about tools, specifically AI, um, that will impact uh, diagnostic improvements in healthcare. The third week um, will be based on the third foundation, and that is the patient physician partnership, um, which hopefully will be uh, enhanced from what it has been in the past. And Dr. Perry Wilson from Yale will talk about that. And finally, uh, the fourth foundation is that 21st century medicine will be personal for each one of us um, based on genomics. And Dr. Jordan Smoller will talk about precision medicine uh, in the fourth week. Um, I couldn't be more thrilled to have Dr. Mark Pettis with us today to open this series. Those of you who live full or part-time in the Berkshires are probably very familiar with Mark and the amazing work that he has done in his presentations over the decades. Um, he, he has recently retired um, after having been in practice for over 30 years. He is a triple board certified internist, nephrologist, and integrative medicine physician. 
He received his BA degree from Boston University and his MD from the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School. Um, he is the former director of medical education, wellness, and population health at Berkshire Health Systems. Um, and he is currently an associate professor of medicine at the UMass School of Public Health. Um, we could not have a better introduction uh, to uh, this series than that from Dr. Pettis. He is superb in interpreting um, uh, current medical uh, issues for the general public. His lecture will be one hour, and then we will turn to um, a, a half an hour of Q&A. So, Mark, it's yours. Thank you, Mary Jane, and thank you to the leadership at Ali, and thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives, wherever you may be. It's a joy to share with you. As Mary Jane alluded to, uh, my background was in nephrology and integrative medicine, which I practiced for over 35 years and have been very committed to medical education through, through those years. And uh, my passion today is really to translate this incredible explosion of aging and longevity science in a way that I hope will create some news to use, things that you can apply in your life. And uh, the research is growing uh, in a most marvelous way. And so it's a joy to share, a joy to be part of this panel with my colleagues and friends. So I'm gonna just share my screen here and get my slide deck up for you. And uh, Mary Jane gave you an outline of the speakers uh, that will be in this series. And today I'm gonna be focusing on some innovative trends in aging and longevity. And as one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, Yogi Berra once said, the future ain't what it used to be. And I could have never possibly contemplated the current state of science, biology, uh, that, that we confront today, uh, 20, 30, even 10 years ago. Uh, and so uh, it, it, there's just so much possibility and hope in what I will be sharing with you. So some questions for consideration. Is longevity genetically predetermined? I was taught, pretty much trained as most American physicians that much of what we confront in our lives, how long we live and what chronic complex diseases we might confront are largely genetically predetermined. The research today would suggest that that is not the case. Um, we'll look at the difference between health span, quality of life and lifespan. We've seen a increase in lifespan over the last century However, for many that has been associated with a profound decline in their quality of life. And it can be said in the United States that we live too short and we die too long. And as a nephrologist, I have treated many, many people with complex biopsychosocial spiritual challenges that um, for many uh, have their lives consumed along the way, even though perhaps they can expect a longer life expectancy. So I'm gonna be focusing a lot on health span, quality of life. Is there a difference between chronologic age and biologic age? And research would suggest that there are now some very um, excellent markers, biomarkers, that would suggest that for many people, biologic age uh, can progress at a very different pace than chronologic age. And we'll, we'll look at some of this research. Is aging a disease? Certainly the prevalence of all chronic complex diseases goes up dramatically as we get older. Um, and might we be uh, more effective as a research enterprise if we shifted from just this narrow focus of treating a specific disease to fo focusing more on treating aging and the drivers of chronic disease. This is a very different sort of paradigm 
that I'm going to be uh, suggesting and what I'll share with you. And lastly, can biologic age be regressed? And uh, I would have to say in 2024, the answer to that unequivocally is yes. So one of the great minds uh, in the world of physics, theoretical physics, quantum physics, Buckminster Fuller once said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I have been most grateful in my professional life to have entered the lives of many. And I've, I've also been a caregiver for my parents who died years ago with very complex health issues. They died at young ages. And I have come to appreciate the marvelous capacity that our medical enterprise has for diagnosing and treating disease and for managing what can be very acute, critical, complex disease. That said, the health of Americans has never been worse. The prevalence of chronic complex disease in the United States has never been greater. The extent to which one out of two adults over the age of 50 is dealing with one or two or more chronic complex diseases is taking more pharmaceutical agents has never been more prominent. And so I would suggest, and I, I don't know that this is uh, a surprise to any of you, that our model is just fundamentally flawed. And I think aging and longevity research uh, is beginning to shed more light and resources on prevention, things that we can do long before diseases manifest. And that is really where my passion is at. As I, as I get older, as I contemplate diseases that took the lives of those that I loved at very young ages and so many people through the years that have taught me so much about, about courage and the ability for the human being to adapt and to rise above incredible challenges. But we, we desperately need to revise our systems of care. Now, Buckminster Fuller, in 1982, published a, a book called Critical Path, and he introduced this concept of the knowledge doubling curve. And not surprisingly, if you go back hundreds of years, knowledge was really not expanding to a, to a large extent. In 1900, it was estimated that knowledge was doubling every century. By the end of World War II, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. We began to see this acceleration where, you know, back when I uh, graduated from medical school, knowledge was doubling every 12 to 13 months. And if you look at the current state, we are in an explosion. We are in, in the midst of a knowledge revolution where knowledge is predicted to double every 11 to 12 hours. That's, an, that's a kind of a mind-bending statistic. The challenge is what do we do with this explosion of knowledge? Most of our structures, educational, certainly medical structure and function is not well adapted to assimilate, to integrate, to process this level of explosion and apply it and translate it in ways that can allow those we serve to derive more benefit in real time. You know, it can take 10, 15 years for a new idea in medicine to weave its way through the, the Byzantine labyrinth of research and uh, protocols before it ultimately gets to the individual. So as the speakers to follow me will focus on, computational capacity, AI, are essential tools that humans will become more dependent on to translate this explosion of knowledge in a way that we can begin to apply in a more personalized, predictive, uh, and proactive way. 
Now, just a, a brief distinction between longevity and health span. You know, a generation ago, uh, people lived shorter lives. This is longevity. And the gray area above this uh, horizontal line would be health span or quality of life. So, you know, average life expectancy in 1900 was like 46, 47 years of age. And health span tended to diminish at a relatively young age. So we didn't live as long and often we saw compromises in quality of life along the way. In the current state, I would suggest this, this middle graphic depicts our current state where life expectancy has certainly gone up, but we've seen this dramatic decline in quality of life. Uh, again, we, we can expect longer lives, but much of that is experienced as functional limitation, disease, disability, and we can all think of examples of that, uh, perhaps in our own lives or in those that we love. Ideally, one would want to not only lengthen life expectancy, but rectangularize this curve so that optimal health functional capacity could be maintained and sustained for most of our life expectancy. Something is going to happen. That's the nature of this reality that, that we are in. But the ideal would be to maintain functional capacity for the majority of one's life expectancy. This is the promise, I would suggest, of aging and longevity research and the interventions that we will likely all be realizing as a consequence of this research enterprise. Now, if I had to reduce all of the life sciences to one graphic, it would look something like this. Your lifestyle and the environment that you embody, what you eat, how you eat, when you eat, how you move, how you sleep, how you interpret and respond to stress in your lives, how much meaning and purpose you cultivate in your work, love, and play, how socially connected you are to people who love you and, and, and who provide compassionate relationship, how much time you spend in nature, how much time you spend in natural full spectrum light, whether or not you have a college education, what your socioeconomics are, are now understood to be the primary driver of how long we live and what our health span is along the way. And this shift in this genetic predeterministic thinking is now understood as an interaction between every aspect of our lifestyle, every choice that we make and the quality of the environments that we, we're in. By quality, are they loving environments? Are they safe environments? Are they quiet environments? Uh, we now know that our genetics, our book of life, that which you inherited from your mother and your father are not etched in stone the way that we once thought was the case. In fact, it is our epigenetics. Uh, it is the uh, part of our DNA that doesn't code for proteins. What they do is they regulate the genes that code for proteins. So if your genes that code for proteins were the hardware of your biology, then your epigenetics, that which interacts in real time, 24 seven, with every choice, every thought, every belief, will regulate, it becomes the software that runs your gene coding for protein biochemistry. So this is a much more malleable, dynamic, uh, plastic model of gene expression. And now we now know, this is a whole new frontier, that the microbiome, this ecosystem of microorganisms, trillions of them in your mouth, on your skin, 
the majority of them would be in your large intestine, your colon. We now know that these are part of human biology. We are a composite organism, partly human, partly microbial. Actually, the microbes are a large part of our composite biology. So every lifestyle choice and the quality of our environment and your beliefs and thoughts will also affect the diversity and balance of this microbial ecosystem. And that balance will influence gene expression. It will influence longevity and health span. And then I would suggest that all of this is held within this domain of uh, what the quantum, what, what Buckminster Fuller and, and many of his predecessors would have, have considered quantum energy fields, consciousness. Um, all worldviews have had some way of expressing this transcendent dimension of our lives as humans. Uh, some might, might call it spiritual, you know, meaning, purpose. This is non-material. This is the, the, the domain of the non-material, light, sound, electromagnetic energy. And quantum science, some of the most precise science on the planet would suggest that these energetic fields influence all that we would consider material science. Modern medicine is in this material reductionist model uh, that really has struggled to more effectively incorporate the quantum. Uh, and I think the, the, the future of medicine will uh, more effectively take into account and integrate the importance of these non-material dimensions of life, how you think, right? How much love uh, and compassion and your beliefs, uh, you know, we know from the placebo effect that your beliefs can alter your biology. The non-material is interacting and altering the expression of the material. So this, I, I think, is a um, just my way of connecting the dots in terms of the current state uh, of, of this uh, remarkable mosaic of, of biology that we are. And your biology becomes your biography. Now, Eric Verdon, uh, Dr. Eric Verdon, is the uh, director of the, um, uh, the Buck Institute. And this is a, a, an aging longevity research center, uh, private research center in Southern California. Some of the best aging research is happening at the Buck. Uh, and, and Dr. Verdon would say that only about 8% of what contributes to longevity can be traced to genetics. And that's a remarkable statement. Over 90% of what contributes to longevity and healthy aging is lifestyle. Epigenetics, this emerging science that would suggest that your choices, your beliefs, your environment will take your book of life, that which you inherited from mom and dad, and it will influence how the chapters to be written in your life are ultimately written. So your DNA, this, this remarkable structure, can translate, can manifest in an infinite number of ways. So same book of life, if you immerse that book of life in different environments, you will get an entirely different person with an entirely different trajectory of health, of quality of life, of possibility. So this is a much more dynamic model. Uh, and so I, I think the predeterministic model of disease uh, is, is just no longer valid. Our genes are important. Certainly, they set the stage. Uh, but that is no longer the um, um, interpretation of who we are and how we function in relationship to the environments that we are in. And the research is quite clear that virtually everything has an epigenetic expression the food that we eat, again, our, our emotional states, our social interactions, 
medicines that we may be prescribed, uh, you know, the, the microbiome, movement, socioeconomics, um, all of these things have been found to influence the epigenetic on and off switches, which is like 97% of your DNA are the so is the software, that is where the regulation is happening. So one might have a gene predisposition for depression or diabetes that will either manifest or may never manifest depending on the nature of these relationships. When there is poor alignment of environmental inputs with that which our biology has adapted to be in relationship with, we then set the stage for what will be disrupted health span and ultimately altered longevity. And research is now suggesting that, and this is rapidly evolving research, has an epigenetic signature. There appear to be certain patterns to the epigenome, these on and off switches, uh, which are also referred to as methylation. Uh, methyl is a, a simple molecule, one carbon and three hydrogens. And you have millions of these little methyl groups attached to your DNA in various ways. And what we're now realizing is that people who age well have a certain epigenetic fingerprint signature compared to those who have uh, may have more accelerated disease risk. And this research has led to the development of tools that can now be readily measured that can give one a sense of what their biologic age is based on these patterns of methyl groups in one's DNA. Stephen Horvath at UCLA was one of the, the pioneers and the first to develop these models. And uh, with a simple saliva sample, you can measure methylation, epigenetic patterns. And what Horvath found and published uh, now over, you know, several years ago was you, for example, could be 60 years of age chronologically, but your biologic age could vary considerably. And there are individuals with more accelerated biologic age that are going to be more functionally limited. And there are some who may uh, age in a more uh, slower fashion compared to their chronologic age and, and maintain functional capacity throughout their lives. It was really a sort of a radical shift and how we think about our ability to measure the extent to which one's lifestyle and environment is either accelerating or decelerating their aging um, rate. There have since been more epigenetic clocks that are developed in, in various labs around the US. They are all looking at these methyl groups on your book of life. They have patterns with, this is where um, high level computational capacity, uh, big data analytics and AI becomes essential in being able to do this work. When you look at large numbers of people, many of whom are very healthy, many of whom may be quite sick, you can begin to get patterns that help you begin to standardize what does an epigenetic clock look like in someone who's aging well versus someone who may not be. And these are examples of uh, different clocks. These are just names um, from the scientists that have developed these clocks looking at these methylation patterns, which are allowing us to better estimate what our biologic ages, which seems to be a predictor of health span and lifespan, as well as mortality risk. And is it possible, based on what we know about epigenetics and how quickly our epigenetic methylation can respond, is it possible to turn that clock back? If one is aging in a more accelerated way, can they slow it down? Uh, certainly something we would all desire. Some of the debate now in the research enterprise 
focuses around, you know, our current model of research is trying to understand diseases. Um, what's the cause of Alzheimer's? What's the cause of diabetes? What's the cause of depression? What's the cause of heart disease? There really are no specific genes that one can look at that would allow you to predict this. And Alzheimer's is, is a perfect example. You know, I, I graduated from medical school 40 years ago, and there has been little, if any, progress in our understanding and treatment of Alzheimer's disease, uh, despite billions and billions of dollars. Part of it, I believe, is we have the wrong model we, the, the paradigm of, of looking at Alzheimer's as a separate, distinct, genetically driven disease has not yielded insights, certainly has not yielded uh, any, in my view, significant therapeutic potential. That can be said for many other chronic diseases. Um, if one tries to target the drivers of aging, might one in a more upstream way, reduce disease risk, regress biologic age, enhance quality of life, and create this virtuous cycle. So this distinction between, uh, this was published in Nature Aging just a few years ago, we know that most diseases go up dramatically as we get older. Treating diseases has not done a whole lot to alter this, this prevalence, this incidence, and certainly has done little, if anything, to alter health span. Is it possible that by focusing on the drivers of aging, that one can delay the onset of disease, improve quality of life or health span along the way, and Research that's been done by um, the Department of Economics at Harvard and uh, Oxford in the UK, and this is largely through um, predictive models, has suggested that if you could slow down aging and, in, and increase life expectancy by one year, that the value of that could be as much as $38 trillion. You enhance... Uh, uh, working capacity, uh, gross domestic product, you, you decrease the expense of treating disease, the, the pharmaceutical, the diagnostic, the intervention. Um, th this could be a huge economic boom if we perhaps shifted the lens through which we look at how we understand the origins of disease and the origins of health. This has led to uh, a great deal of research in what is now referred to as the hallmarks of aging. There are no specific diseases here. Uh, and these hallmarks of aging are things like genomic instability. Over time, our, our genes don't reproduce quite as well. Cancer is an example of that. Um, Epigenetics, we know uh, the software gets altered. We lose that programming, that which was ideally designed to allow us to live long and well. Our cells age, and normally an aging cell would recycle. We call that autophagy. Uh, if an aging cell is unable to recycle, it creates inflammation, which is a major driver of all age-related diseases. As we get older, we lose stem cells. Stem cells are, are uh, um, juvenile cells that can become more mature tissue. It's how we regenerate our cells. The cells in your body are turning over all the time. Uh, stem cells allow that to happen, but we lose that capacity as we get older. Our, our telomeres, the ends of our of our DNA chromosomes lose their little caps. That is associated with accelerated aging. Our mitochondria, these, these uh, energy producing cells, this is the uh, basically the uh, what really allows cells to do what they need to do because it produces the energy. And mitochondria are so special. They've got their own DNA, which by the way, comes from your mother. Your mother's DNA is in every mitochondria in your body. That's 
um, three cheers for the divine feminine. Uh, so what all of these hallmarks share in common is that they tend to break down as we get older. And whether you're dealing with Alzheimer's, heart disease, diabetes, depression, Parkinson's, ALS, cancer, you will find multiple examples of breakdown in these hallmarks. So is it possible that if we focus more on these hallmarks, that we can dramatically alter the emergence and the aggression of chronic complex disease? And that's the, the basis of much of the current aging and longevity research. And this research is now attempting to improve these sort of metabolic fault lines by reprogramming this epigenome, reprogramming the software, these little methyl groups in your book of life, these epigenetic clocks. So some of the research I'm gonna be sharing with you has attempted to alter the software in a way that would improve these hallmarks of aging and is it possible that one might actually regress biologic age as a consequence of doing that? One of the, the leading theories of aging uh, is uh, David Sinclair and his lab at Harvard, but many, many others um, that, that have been doing this work believe that it is this epigenetic information, the, the the software that runs your DNA, 97% of your DNA is software. It is information. Uh, people who do holistic work in, in medicine uh, frequently refer to food as information. Um, all of our environmental inputs can be thought of as information, quality of which varies considerably. Over time, we seem to lose this programming and 21st century environments are, I would suggest, quite hostile to human biology. We have more environmental toxins than ever in our environment. 93% of Americans spend little time outdoors. Most of that time is spent indoors under non-native lighting, very little natural light. We have so much polarity and conflict and, you know, just dealing with the news and social media can, can be a real source of, of conflict and trauma and fear. And so all of this translates at the level of our epigenetics by changing those methylation profiles. And that's where the rubber appears to meet the road in terms of altering the downstream expression of health. So the research is beginning to suggest that we can take this individual and by altering the environment of that individual to a more health promoting one, that we can reprogram the epigenetics of that individual in a way that will produce another individual. Uh, contemplate the fact that there are an infinite, an infinite array of possible yous um, and if you if you believe in multiverse theory and quantum physics, there could be a U on a number of parallel universes. But each U has a very different experience of life. The research is suggesting that we have the capacity to do that today. So let's look at a, a, a few of uh, the research trials that are attempting to address these hallmarks of aging. And this is a... Um, a summary slide, an excellent paper from Leonard Garenti. He's at MIT, a, a real pioneer in epigenetic research. Uh, Guido Cromer um, is a, in, on the West Coast. Uh, also a, uh, a tremendous researcher in this field. And when you look at the, and I know this is a bit technical, but I know I know the Ali crowd loves this level of depth, these are different hallmarks of aging, right? The mitochondria, um, DNA repair, et cetera. Um, in this example, metformin, uh, which is a, a widely prescribed medication for diabetes and prediabetes, 
is being researched because it does seem to alter mitochondrial function in a very positive way. Um, and so it, it can help with the uh, uh, expression and generation of energy. And is it possible? Uh, the jury is out on all of these interventions, but these are current research trials looking at these different compounds. Here, the research is focusing on our ability to repair our DNA, right? Once we have a change, how quickly can we repair that? We have those software systems inside of us, but they have to be activated. They require the right environmental conditions and lifestyle choices in order to be activated. Here, the interest is in what's known as NAD. NAD is a uh, a, a cofactor that's involved in hundreds of biochemical reactions, but is particularly important in our ability to repair our DNA and to help uh, with epigenetic signaling. Um, nicotine riboside and nicotine mono riboside are NAD boosters. Uh, again, I'll share a little bit of that research with you most of this research is being done in animals, and there are a few human trials now that are beginning. The, a good example of uh, this uh, signaling, nutrient signaling hallmark of aging, we lose our ability, uh, which is one of the reasons that, that we may be seeing more obesity, more diabetes and pre-diabetes. This insulin sensitivity is a, is a problem. We've become insulin resistant. We're hungry all the time. Um, the, the current obesity injections are GLP-1 agonists. These are um, uh, agents that um, um, affect the what, what is a hormone produced in the gut. Um, and again, we don't know in humans whether this will have an impact on longevity or health span. It certainly uh, appears to be an effective strategy for weight loss and improving insulin sensitivity. Another, and again, these are all big topics, and I'm sorry to be going over them at a, at a very high level, but another area of uh, hallmark of aging is our ability of our cells to regulate their growth and for the proteins that they produce to remain intact. As our proteins get older, they lose their three-dimensional configuration. They lose their function cells lose their capacity to regulate growth, which might lead to a rogue cell that becomes cancer. This is a pathway, uh, a, a, an aging pathway known as mTOR. And rapamycin, which is a, a pharmaceutical that is prescribed in transplant recipients, uh, is known to inhibit mTOR. Uh, so this is being studied as well. Um, human trials are currently underway. Uh, spermidine is a compound in, um, uh, it can be found in mushrooms and other um, whole food sources that also appears to help with senescent cells. It helps our cells turn over um, Curcumin, another compound being widely studied. You know, these senolytics, again, are an attempt to take a senescent cell and recycle it so that it's not hanging around uh, too long. Probiotics, uh, looking at the microbiome, this, this new frontier, the probiotic and the, and the biome is still a bit of a black box. There's a tremendous amount of research uh, but what we do know is that the diversity of this ecosystem seems to be a very strong predictor of health and longevity. And so there's a lot of research now looking at what types of organisms taken might uh, benefit uh, in a more uh, health promoting way, a diverse biome. And then many of you are aware, excuse me, of of uh, inflammation, this immune system that tends to be on overdrive that is associated with many, many uh, accelerated aging and chronic complex diseases. There are many anti-inflammatory agents, some of them in, in very active use for rheumatoid arthritis, 
uh, and other uh, inflammatory conditions, but these are relatively new to the, to the science of aging and longevity. And I think there'll be a lot more research there. Our NAD levels um, go down as we age. Uh, there's a complete agreement to that. Um, and we know that epigenetics and mitochondria and insulin signaling, all of the hallmarks of aging appear to be affected by this. Um, what is unclear is if you take one of those NAD precursors and get your NAD levels up, can you mitigate this trajectory? Uh, in animals, that appears to be the case. Um, in humans, it has not yet been widely studied. These are the two agents nicotinamide, riboside, these would be supplements, and our NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, the body converts these to NAD. Human research would suggest that if you take one of these, your NAD levels will go up. What's unclear is will it have the longer term effect on aging and longevity that we would desire? That the jury's out on this. A slide from Rhonda Patrick, another great aging longevity researcher on the West Coast. And just a reminder, because um, I'm going to come back to lifestyle. There are many aspects of lifestyle that we know will enhance longevity and quality of life. So we know that intermittent fasting, restricting calories, sometimes through intermittent fasting, that's one way to do it. Exercise, taking you know these these NAD boosters will increase NAD levels, and in animals, for sure, you see all kinds of positive health effects: uh, better insulin production, better cognition in the brain, better mitochondrial function, less inflammation. NAD has its impact in many ways, but the research here are in these family of genes known as sirtuin genes. Leonard Guarenti has done a lot of this research at MIT. And we know that many plant-based compounds like resveratrol, um, plants have many phytonutrients that give them pigment, that uh, give them the ability to defend themselves against other species. Many of these compounds, when ingested by other species, seem to activate these pathways. I talked briefly about um, rapamycin and mTOR. Again, uh, this is a major uh, hallmark of aging that is central in regulating our metabolism. And um, one might say modern life uh, turns this up in, a, in too aggressive a, a, a pattern. And the uh, output of that is accelerated aging and higher risk of chronic complex disease. So might inhibiting this or, or dampening this uh, by using rapamycin uh, help with that, uh, that challenge? And again, uh, many aspects of the hallmarks of aging seem to uh, benefit by inhibition of this important metabolic pathway. And this is an ongoing study currently, um, results of which have not yet been published, uh, looking at rapamycin. This is a randomized controlled trial in human aging and longevity. Many of you are, are familiar with stem cells. This research has been around for a long time. It's always been a bit controversial by virtue of the fact that one of the greatest sources of stem cells historically have been uh, embryonic, either uh, umbilical cord blood or fetal tissue. Um, but what we know is that stem cells can become many cells uh, and appear to uh, um, be central in the ability to rejuvenate tissue to heal from wounds, to turn over and recycle our organs, which they do on a regular basis, uh, major pathway to assure health span and longevity. And so the research here has been, is it possible to induce a stem cell without having to take umbilical cord blood or fetal tissue? 
And it was in 2012. I think this is perhaps one of the great uh, discoveries thus far of the 21st century uh, by Yamanaka Shinya from Japan, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine. He essentially discovered that you could take a mature cell, in this example, a skin cell. It has already grown. It can be nothing but a skin cell. And you could introduce those mature cells to growth factors. These are factors that we produce in our bodies. You know, these are genes that our book of life produces. And he found, he studied many different proteins, but there were four in particular. And when he introduced those four proteins into these mature cells, and the way to do that is with viruses. Viruses will insert proteins into your uh, book of life. Uh, and so these mature cells started to become young. And he was able to take a mature cell and turn it into a pluripotent cell, a cell that could become any organ. This was a revolutionary uh, finding that has been reproduced in other labs. And we know that stem cells, uh, the research today would suggest that they have great potential to treat hematologic malignancies, heart disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, MS, the, right? These chronic degenerative diseases, cancer, spinal cord injury, stroke, by virtue of their ability to regenerate and rejuvenate tissue. And this has led to what I believe to be the, the sort of the current vanguard of where this research is at. And again, this, this research is still nascent and still largely uh, um, in animal studies. But this is research from um, Brigham and Women's at Harvard, uh, as well as um, uh, MIT, where in mice, mice with diseases, they use these factors, these Yamanaka factors, in an effort to alter the aging and disease progress of these mice. And what you see in the research that's being published, not just in, in uh, Harvard and MIT's labs, but, but elsewhere, as I'll share with you briefly, you could take an old senescent mouse. And with these Yamanaka factors, uh, you just inject them into the mouse. What you see is the epigenetic clock for that mouse regresses. You see an epigenetic profile that is, is more comparable to that of a younger, youthful, active mouse. Uh, so when they give these factors, they're essentially reprogramming the DNA. They're, they're, they're changing the software that ultimately changes the gene expression of that animal. And this older mouse becomes a younger mouse. Uh, it has better vision. It navigates the maze and gets the cheese in record time. It has a more youthful uh, state. It, when, you, when you measure markers of aging, inflammation, uh, diabetes, you see improvements. Now, you also can see early evidence of, of tumor growth. Um, so, you know, again, this is this is uh, science that very much needs to be refined in terms of finding, you know, the right ways to do this. This, for me, is proof of concept uh, where you can actually um, uh, regress aging biology. Now, what what he's also found, these are mice that have had damage to their optic nerve. So these mice essentially are blind. And. When mice are given these Yamanaka factors, in this example, it's given right into the eye, um, into the vitreum of the eye. It can access the retina. Quickly, you see healing of this optic nerve. Generally, nerve tissue, when it's damaged, does not heal well. Um, stroke is a good example. Um, you know, ALS, MS, good example. Uh, they saw a complete regression of nerve damage in these mice compared to the controls that continue to have uh, optic nerve damage. Um, um, again, sort of proof of concept. Greg Fahey at UCLA, 
uh, has done the first research in humans using uh, approaches like this. Uh, these are small studies, you know, a dozen or so people, proof of concept. And what Fahey and his colleagues looked at was the thymus. The thymus is a, a gland in humans that produces immune cells. And as we get older, the thymus atrophies and it becomes dysfunctional. It, it has very little biologic function. And what um, Fahey did was he gave these humans uh, some of these protein, these, these factors, uh, also gave them metformin, uh, you know, as an example, you know, something we talked about. And what they found, they ended up uh, doing biopsies of the thymus gland before and after. Uh, what they found was that they regressed the epigenetic age of these thymus cells. When they looked at the methylation patterns of the thymus, they had regressed to a more youthful um, um, profile. And the gene expression of those cells came back to life. Uh, they, you know, these cells became more active uh, and they used their epigenetic clock measures to correlate that improvement in function with changes in these epigenetic profiles. Um, and as Fahey accurately said, this was the first published study to predict uh, or, or to suggest an increase in lifespan by means of uh, an accessible aging intervention. And uh, I know this is hard to interpret, but this is a, uh, an MRI uh, of the thymus gland before, um, and this sort of um, uh, cloudy grayish appearance, this is mostly uh, scar tissue, fat. There's really nothing viable or biologically active here. This was converted to very active, biologically uh, uh, sensitive uh, immunologic tissue uh, nine months out. And they postulated, this is a, an interesting concept uh, known as the escape velocity. Fahey postulated that uh, if a person is aging, say one year out and they've aged a year, and you can regress that so that tissues can repair faster than they are aging, you can escape this aging trajectory, right? This escape velocity. And his results, um, he regressed aged about a year and a half in these thymus uh, as measured by the epigenetic clocks in the thymus glands of these adults. Uh, um, a year went by and they regressed about a year and a half, excuse me. And that's the longevity escape velocity. Other research, just quite briefly as I bring this home, this is research by Cara Fitzgerald of the Institute for Functional Medicine in Washington State, um, where she took, again, this is sort of proof of concept, a small group of women, and they looked at their epigenetic aging uh, through sampling and these women were then subjected. There was a control group that just lived as they usually live. And then there was an intervention group that was put on a Whole Foods nutritional program. They were taught meditation, uh, sleep hygiene, um, kind of a Dean Ornish holistic approach. They were also given probiotics. And um, what Fitzgerald and her, her team found was that when you looked at the biologic age as measured by these epigenetic methylation patterns, these biologic clocks, the group that got nothing after one year aged about a year, as, as you might have predicted. Those that were treated regressed their biologic age about two years over that one year period. This would be escape velocity. Again, this is just proof of concept. Um, um, but I, I do think we, we already know that healthy living can add years to one's life and improve one's health span. This, I think, is demonstrating epigenetic mechanisms that seem to affect the hallmarks of aging, and that is where the promise lies, right? So how can we, how can we translate this in day-to-day -day life in 2024? 
Well, you know, I think it is important to consider the fact that your biology, human biology is adapted over hundreds of thousands of years. Modern humans, you know, were probably beginning to hit the scene a couple hundred thousand years ago. The environments within which human biology has evolved look very different than 21st century environments. So I would suggest that one of the drivers of, of these hallmarks of aging is that we have more disconnect between a Stone Age biology and a modern environment that for many of us is just no longer compatible. This is research uh, just sort of confirming the importance of healthy lifestyle. This uh, was just published uh, a month ago from the VA in Boston, also the Brigham um, and um, um, the um, uh, Emory University Cardiovascular Lab. And they recruited about 275,000 veterans. Uh, these veterans were um, well followed within the system. They had lots of data and they were interested in looking at various degrees of lifestyle factors. These were the, the eight that they looked at. Never smoking, physically active, that might be walking 30 minutes a day, five days a week, alcohol in moderation only, um, healthy sleep hygiene, whole foods nutrition, some tools to manage stress, um, connected socially in a very positive and affirming way, not, not social media, uh, and no history of an opioid use disorder. These were the eight factors. Now, what they found was over about five years that these individuals were uh, studied. Not surprisingly, as a VA study, about 93% were male. What these graphs depict is how much more life could one expect on average beyond the age of 40 if they had all eight of, whoops, excuse me, all eight of these healthy uh, lifestyle attributes all the way down to one or even zero. Now, the average age of death in this VA cohort that had no low risk factors, in other words, they smoked, they had an opiate use disorder, they ate processed food, they didn't have any of these healthy lifestyle factors. The average age uh, before death was 63 years of age. For those individuals that had all eight, they could expect 24 additional years of life. Average uh, age of death, 87 years, with the difference being 24 years. Um, on the right, it's the same data in women. Uh, women that had no healthy lifestyle factors at the age of 40 had an average mortality uh, at the age of 67, a little bit more uh, older than men. Uh, those that had all eight healthy, low-risk lifestyle factors added 20 years to their lives with an average age of mortality of 87. So we already know um, what lifestyle attributes can enhance our longevity, can enhance our health span, and mechanistically, we're beginning to understand probably regress biologic aging restore and maintain functional capacity and uh, um, allow the rejuvenation software that, that can help the hallmarks of aging sustain themselves in a more viable way uh, is, is where the mechanisms I think are now beginning to be explored more deeply. And many of you are familiar with the blue zones. I talk a lot about this, parts of the world where people um, not uncommonly live to be a hundred plus with a very good quality of life, right? So they're they're living long and, and enjoying tremendous independence and functional capacity, right? And these are the sort of attributes of those healthy uh, lifestyle attributes, you know, not quite the same as what the VA study looked at, but, you know, just the importance of, of, of 
breaking free from this hubbub of modern life and this cacophony of, of conflict and polarization, um, cultivating purpose and meaning, right? Plant-based foods definitely uh, seem to confer many health benefits. Uh, you know, alcohol in moderation. Uh, and again, I, I, I know this is sort of a no-brainer for each of you, but the point is that we have good epidemiologic data. We have good basic research data. Now we're beginning to see interventions beyond lifestyle that can possibly modulate our rate of aging. And again, that is a, uh, a story of hope and promise. And this is sort of a summary slide. Um, and I come back to this, this lens of ancestral living. You know, we don't have to be uh, on the African savanna to realize these benefits. But if we can take some of the ancestral ways of life and weave them in to our modern life, we probably would realize tremendous benefit and we would likely realize that benefit in short order. A concept of metabolic flexibility is really these hallmarks of aging, these metabolic you know, fault lines. Our ability to maintain and restore metabolic balance as we take hits in modern life and recover from those hits is more important than ever. This is an environment that if you leave your biology to chance, you are likely going to confront some serious challenges. So circadian rhythms, being in sync with sun rising, sun setting, being outdoors more, particularly early in the morning. Anytime you can, you can watch a sunrise or, or be present in that early morning sunlight, there's a lot of light is information. That's not just light, it's information. These are wavelengths of light that will alter your biology. We call that photobiomodulation. Um, sleep hygiene, light exposure, you know, gut health, um, you know, meaningful relationships, right? Resistance, building some muscle mass, very, very important in fostering these, these um, hallmarks of aging. Um, at times moving quickly and at times slowing down, right? Novel, new, exciting, stimulating experiences like, um, like an Ollie health series, uh, you know, these are all uh, really good um, principles to just bear in mind. And as the great Yogi once said, the future ain't what it used to be. And I think a lot of this research will continue to evolve quickly and will, for all of us, allow us to uh, rethink about our ability to influence um, every aspect of our, of our life and, you know, again, I think that is a story of promise. And so I will end there. I ran a few minutes over, but I, I know we have plenty of time for questions. And I thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I, I will just... Um... I will just uh, uh, echo some of the comments in the, in the chat that this was really um, an outstanding presentation. Um, I'm going to go. Uh, uh, one thing I would like to ask um, the Ali uh, uh, office right now: Will um, the recording will be available where? And Mark, will you make your slide deck available? Yeah, okay. I can absolutely make my slide deck available, Mary Jane. I, I would defer to you and the Ollie team as to whether I might forward that to you uh, as a PDF file, and then you could maybe forward it to those that registered, um, if that works. Okay, okay so um, Ollie, Ollie folks, Judith or Ray or someone, how would you like to handle that? Yeah, if you if you email it to us at the office or to Mary Jane, she'll get it to us. And what we do is for those people who have registered, once the video is ready to go out, we will email it to everyone who has registered. It will right. also be available on the Ollie YouTube um, page, free and um, available. Probably give us 48 hours just to be sure, but you'll get it soon. So I would suggest that Mark, you send the slide deck as a as a PDF. That would be fine directly to the Ali office, so that I won't have to be a, a go between here. That answered the first question about uh, recording. Um, and let me just um, come down here. We have several of these recording questions. Um, 
Okay, the books, I guess these are the books that I mentioned. Uh, one of them is by Leroy Hood, and it's The Age of Scientific Wellness. The second book is Outlive, and that's by Peter Atia. Um, Great books, okay. by the way, Mary Jane. Yeah, really, really good. Peter Atia does have a uh, podcast, but it's um, it's behind a paywall. So, um, okay, so here's a question. Um, what is your take on alpha keto glutarate for slowing aging? Yeah, great question. Um, alpha keto glutarate is on that list. I, I didn't have a chance to review it. Thank you for asking this would be on uh, the list of active molecules being studied with respect to its ability to enhance favorably these hallmarks of aging. Alpha-ketoglutarate is a, a molecule that is um, part of our metabolic pathways, which uh, you know we learned as the Krebs cycle in, in school. I'm probably giving some people PTSD as they think back on, on some of this biochemistry. Alpha-ketoglutarate is an important uh, mediator of that metabolic cycle and appears to be an important player in mitochondrial health, bioenergetics and mitochondrial health. So it's definitely on that list. And uh, there are a few uh, studies in animals uh, that would suggest positive benefits and uh, some some early data in humans as well. Um, another question here, how has COVID affected the mitochondria with respect to aging or is it too soon to tell? I've yet to see any research that specifically addresses that. Um, pure speculation on my part, but I suspect for many of us, had we done a, an epigenetic age, a methylation pattern pre-COVID and compared that with an epigenetic age measurement uh, in 2021 or 22, we probably would have seen some, some acceleration of, of aging there. These are, these are moving targets. Um, we certainly know that the inflammation of, uh, for many, COVID has taken on more of a chronic, enduring, inflammatory uh, presence. And one might predict that um, that would create more demands on, on aging and quality of life longer term. And so lifestyle becomes even more important as we reflect back on some of the challenges we've all been through. The beauty of this epigenetic research is it is it it is quite malleable. You can take, um, and this has been done in in um, the ice uh, storm study in Quebec, looked at um, women who were pregnant at the time of this horrible um, meteorological event that left a lot of Quebec stranded and isolated. Uh, food couldn't get in. When they looked at the epigenetics of mom and their offspring. They, they had much more of a, an accelerated uh, inflammatory aging pattern, probably from the trauma of that environment at a time of, of, of that development in those young kids. Um, they've also shown that one can regress those changes. Um, okay. Um, there's a, a, a question here about discussing blue zones, but I think you have touched on that. And uh, our next project, Mark, is to establish a Berkshire Blue Zone, right? Exactly. Um, I love that. Yeah. Um, here's a question. Um, is rapamycin used in the do dog longevity studies? Um, I believe rapamycin, um, it's definitely been used in animal studies. I don't know if those studies were dog. I believe so. Um, the, the study that I shared with you is a human trial, um, but and there's a lot of experience with rapamycin as an immunosuppressant transplant, anti-rejection medication, but I believe dogs were included in animal trials prior. Um, this is a, um, a question to define uh, NAD levels, um, if you want to take that. Yeah, I mean, that... 
That is a really superb question and, and not as straightforward as one might think. All of the research to date has looked at blood levels, serum levels of NAD. Uh, you get the baseline, you take one of these NAD boosters like NR, three months later, you measure a serum level of NAD and uh, clearly this is bioavailable and levels will go up. Um, Leonard Garenti did some of the original research in this at MIT and found about a 40 percent increase in serum NAD levels. The, the, the controversy is, does that correlate with tissue or cell uh, levels? And I don't think we know the answer to that. They may or may not. So what is measured in the blood may not correlate with NAD levels in the brain or in the heart. Um, so right now, those serum levels are a surrogate for what is felt to be um, higher tissue levels. In animals, um, some of that has been done at, and tissue levels do go up, but they don't always correlate or correspond to the increases you see in the blood. Um, here's another question. Um, many people with light skin are cautioned to stay out of the sun unless we use protections for the skin. Uh, the same about those who have AMD. We are cautioned to stay out of the sun or use dark glasses. Is vitamin D a good substitute? Yeah, these are great questions. Um, uh, with respect to fair skin, skin type, uh, and there's no question there are skin types or skin cancer histories that should leave one very cautious about how much time they're exposed and when they are exposed. That said, one, as little as 10 to 15 minutes of exposure, face, short sleeve shirt, in the early morning hours, within a couple of hours of sunrise, later in the day, late afternoon, early evening, in the spring, summer season, ultraviolet levels tend to be much lower at those bookends of the diurnal cycle. Uh, fair skin, you might even start with a few minutes and, and build up a little bit of, a, of, of, of callus, if you will. Um, so one can get all the benefits of sun and the information from those patterns of light, blue light in the morning predominantly in that full spectrum. Later in the day, it tends to be more of the yellow, orange, red, of the color spectrum and infrared. Um, so that is a good way to get the health benefits, the synchronization, this entrainment from sun rising, sun setting without much ultraviolet exposure. Certainly um, vitamin D, um, ultraviolet B, UVB light is, is how we make vitamin D. Now, nature doesn't make mistakes. There's a reason for that. Uh, we were intended to produce vitamin D through sun exposure. One can increase their levels of vitamin D through supplementation. And when you live at a Northern latitude, like we do in the Berkshires, you won't make any vitamin D between October and maybe late March. So taking a supplement becomes essential in maintaining those vitamin D levels. But whether there's a difference between vitamin D from sun production versus supplement. Whether there's a difference there is has not been well established. Um, uh, so all of that is to say, get as much sun as you safely can. Those, those times of day will be more protective. A supplement is very helpful if your levels are low and most of us that live at this latitude will have low levels. So you wanna, you wanna get a level um, and generally, uh, I want to supplement to get a level up to at least 30, 30 to 50, uh, nanograms per deciliter is, is the, is the units. And that generally is going to require a few thousand units a day over the, the winter season. 
Um, just a comment about the um, that this presentation was excellent. And I think you now have the information about um, both a PDF file for the slide deck, as well as the recording of the pr presentation. Another uh, question here. A friend of mine with MS has been receiving treatment with stem cells for 15 years. She has had improvements, but not a cure. Um, any comments, I suppose? Yeah, I mean, I, I um, you know, it. I, I, the, I think the best case scenario there in that example is altering the biology of that of that MS, that process, that autoimmunity, to sort of slow down progression or to mitigate more frequent relapses. Um, I've yet to see stem cells. Um, any research suggesting cures with uh, MS? Um, there are many effective lifestyle strategies for MS that um, some of you might be familiar with Dr. Terry Walls, W-A-H-L-S, Terry Walls. Um, she is an internist in the University of Iowa system who um, had rapidly progressive MS, very um, assertive and went from having very normal life and a full-time practice to being wheelchair bound and um, uh, tried everything conventionally that wasn't working for her. When she started to apply some of these whole foods, nutrient dense foods, vi higher vitamin D, um, uh, her book d describes her story and she's now doing research. She was able to totally regress her MS um, I don't know that she would call it a cure, uh, but she went from being wheelchair bound to uh, biking competitively. <laughs> I mean, that's unheard of. There isn't anything uh, that big pharma can produce to date that can have that effect. Um, she did most of that through lifestyle, through um, uh, uh, electromuscular nerve stimulation, um, if you Google her, she's got some great presentations. Her book is terrific. And um, I know that she's doing a lot of research currently. Another question here. When, when mice were given Yamanaka factors, what, if any, mental changes were measured along with turning back the clock? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit hard to, to sort of assess cognition in a mouse. Uh, generally, um, they're subjected to, uh, you know, running the maze to get the cheese and how effectively can they do that? Uh, or, um, and this, this raises some ethical concerns, but sometimes they will be challenged uh, by putting them in a vat of water and giving them specific areas they can swim to, but it, but it requires some level of assessment and uh, decision making, if you will, and so generally they they measure those response times, uh, and they they tend to dramatically improve. They get the cheese much faster. They run on their running wheels. Um, not that that's cognitive, but but these are surrogates that that do seem to correlate very strongly with cognitive function. Dr. Pettis, thank you for including the risk of environmental toxins in your insightful presentation. Couldn't physicians and public health officials advocate for, advocate for ecological land care? And that means avoiding pesticides and herbicides on lawns and gardens for residential, educational, and municipal properties. Yes. <laughs> Exclamation yep. point, yes. I mean, great comment. Um, and I, and I didn't have a chance to go deep into the environmental toxin challenge. We are all canaries in the coal mine. There are over 80,000 uh, accepted environmental toxins uh, on our planet. Glyphosate, Roundup, uh, is ubiquitous. You, you could take an Arctic sea sponge and you will find glyphosate in it. Um, um, it's, I think it is the elephant in the room and, um, uh, physicians get very little training in environmental toxicology. Um, I, th I think it's 
it may be one of the biggest public health issues that we confront. And we know that what's good for the planet is good for the those that inhabit the planet. Go figure, right? We're all part of this ecosystem. Um, I don't know how to reconcile that. I find it overwhelming at times. Um, my amygdala discharges when I think about it. Um, and I, you know, I just try to be a, a faithful steward in my own life and to try to um, uh, heighten the awareness of others that whenever you can, organic or uh, the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org, has a great um, uh, compendium of information, the dirty dozen produce that have the highest pesticide residues, the clean 15, those that that um, tend to be you know, residue free. Um, they have a cosmetic database called Skin Deep. So many products uh, that we, we put on our skin and our face, many putting on sunblock with endocrine disrupting chemicals in it, blocking what would otherwise be therapeutic information from this. It's, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting paradox um, and it's really problematic. And when you look at endocrine disruption, and I'm ranting a bit, Mary Jane, I'm, I apologize, but you look at kids today, um, kids that are dealing with um, um, polycystic ovarian disease, um, childhood obesity, insulin, re metabolic insulin resistance, you, you'll, it's turning up now in kids in middle school. Um, you know, these are, um, it's, this is a very hostile environment for human health. And if one isn't a bit more proactive without getting too overwhelmed by it in ways that they can mitigate exposure and enhance their ability to, um, bioeliminate it, it, it will tend to catch up with you in some way. It's death by a thousand cuts. Um, the, the thing that really blew my mind was no, learning that glyphosate is used for grain ripening, uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, they actually spray it on the grain to ripen it faster. Okay. Yeah. Um, how does one have their methylations measured? There are a number of, of direct-to-consumer uh, labs now. Um, if you were to go on, uh, say, Amazon and um, type in um, Horvath, H-O-R-V-A-T-H. He was one of the original researchers at UCLA. Uh, the Horvath test is available. Uh, you can probably get it through, if you Google it, you may find other ways you can get it. Uh, but I know Amazon just happens to have it. Uh, it's a saliva test. So you send a container, you spit in it, ship it back. And you know, in a couple of weeks, you'll get a result. Um, they're still a little bit pricey. Uh, the Horvath test is one of the, the cheaper tests and it, it's about 250. Um, Insurance, to my knowledge, is you know are, isn't going to pay for this. Um, Leonard Garenti's lab at MIT and David Sinclair, a lot of these these labs have their own um, epigenetic aging tests. And um, you know, if you Google that, you'll get many labs that can offer this direct directly to you. A uh, comment here: Singapore has recently been admitted as the sixth blue zone. Um, location. Uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, showing the the slide about NAD again, we, we have um, indicated how you can get the PDF of um, uh, Dr. Pettis's slide deck. Um, can you talk a bit about gut health? I can indeed. I can talk for a long time <laughs> about gut health, uh, which is a great... Um, uh, uh, area to, to, to spend a few minutes on, um, the gut as an ecosystem is, is where most of our microbiome coexists. And we know that the standard American diet, which has so little fermentable fiber in it, has probably led to the obliteration of many of the commensal microbes that historically we coexisted with. 
Um, so the food supply uh, has obliterated the diversity of our biome. You can take the ubiquitous use of antibiotics uh, that may not be appropriate for like a viral infection. Um, we know that children who come into the world, C-section as opposed to vaginally, uh, bottle feeding versus breastfeeding. There are many systemic um, drivers that lead to a, an altered microbiome, which is just one factor of gut health. Um, so generally, uh, what I'm focusing on there is nutritionally trying to introduce more plant-based foods, fermentable fiber, certainly reducing or eliminating flour, sugar, um, some of these rapidly broken down, um, easy to ferment sugars, which promote uh, disproportionate growth of these less healthy strains. Plant-based foods not only have more fiber, um, but they also have these polyphenols, right? Some of these plant-based compounds like resveratrol that are known to affect the biome and all these hallmarks of aging, very, very important. I might also consider a, uh, a prebiotic, which is essentially fiber. Um, uh, and examples of that might be Metamucil, um, might be uh, Acacia. Acacia is, a, you know, these are supplements that one could buy encapsulated or powder. Uh, a probiotic. Um, probiotics um, really haven't been shown to uh, sort of grow a new biome. Um, generally, the organisms in a probiotic will fall off pretty quickly, but they what they do seem to do is to uh, dampen inflammation. Much of inflammation in our body has its origins in the gut. Uh, we call that leaky gut. So greater attention to the quality of food, fiber, considering a probiotic, um, being mindful of antibiotic exposure, whether that's um, in a prescription or in commercially produced foods like, you know, poultry and, and uh, you know, a lot of these animals get a lot of antibiotic and we consume that, um, you know, down-regulating, whether it's through breath, guided imagery, meditation, prayer. Uh, these are all really important aspects of gut health. And then, and then again, um, sometimes over the counter things like, uh, you know, the, the, the purple pill and, uh, Advil things that we might take routinely for heartburn or for an ache when taken longer term are very disruptive to the ecosystem of the gut. And, um, so it can take a while to taper off some of those things, but there are many things that one can do to enhance gut health. And that is, probably one of the more common areas of focus and opportunity in the work that I do and many people that do more holistic work. Um, there are so many other uh, questions here. Um, a question about what could AI contribute to understanding and identifying factors in aging and diseases. Tune in next week for the next uh, presentation. Um, uh, Again, there there are there are many many questions here, but we're after seven o'clock. I did put the titles of the two books and the authors into the chat if people want that. And I think um, we have to figure out uh, a way of um, of answering some of these questions. I just have one more <laughs> that I think just struck me here. I, I'm reading it. Well. <laughs> Okay, will an overact will an overweight, inactive seventy year old derive any longevity benefits if he can be be persuaded to change his ways now? Yes, with it with it, yes with a capital Y, and with an excla exclamation point. It's a really good question. It it certainly the research would suggest that there is no point on the age continuum where one can't significantly regress drivers of disease and diminished health span. I, I would not discount the opportunity there just because of what you might perceive as, as um, uh, you know, too far out of the barn, if you will. Not the case. Um, 
we have to figure out, as I said, a way of of, of getting to all these questions. But I think we're we're at um, um, uh, time uh, at this point. So it says the books are not showing in the chat, but it it is Leroy Hood, The Age of Scientific Wellness, and Peter Atia Outlive. So. Um, and one person was requesting that you mention the title of Terry Wall's book. Yeah. Um, what is the title of her book? Um, I am going to check that right now. Her book is called The Walls Protocol, W A. HLS protocol, the walls protocol. Okay. Okay, doke. Thank you. Um, I don't know why the books aren't showing in the chat, but but um I did mention that. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you so much to the um audience who who tuned in and who asked such wonderful questions. Uh and uh, comment here about you have provided so much useful information. Now go out and be healthy. Yes, <laughs> we will. <laughs> yeah, don't forget to love yourself, you know, give yourself a hug. Um, really important. So thank you, thank Mary you. Really, really thank great you. to be with you and the Ali listeners. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ray, for putting that into the into the chat. All righty. Take care, everyone. Bye. Enjoy your evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so Good much. Night.